Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. I know you have been enjoying your food, but uh, uh, greater stuff is here, actually. Though I would, I've always appreciated F FCC's food. I'm uh, William from uh, South China Morning Post. I'm also a fellow FCC member here. I will be moderating today's section with a towering figure in China studies, Professor Jean-Pierre Capaston. He started his China trip in 1970s, 1977, where I was still a toddler then. <laughs> That's how far his China research and uh, his observation of China goes. And uh, he has been, he's a very familiar figure here. In 2019, I'm not sure how many of you have attended his talk on his previous book, previous book called Tomorrow China, democracy or dictatorship? Well, nowadays, the, I think the answer is pretty obvious. Uh, <laughs> he has brought another book to us, a quality read on uh, Facing China, the prospect of war and peace. Though we always, in FCC, we always bring people that we always say, this guest needs no introduction, but as a formality, let me still quickly go through his long credentials. Yeah, <laughs> I will make it short. <laughs> now, and uh, Professor Gao Jingwen, that's how uh, his China colleagues would call him, is the Emeritus Professor of Pro Pro Political Science, Department of Government and International Studies at the HKBU. And he is also Emeritus Senior Researcher at the French National Center for Scientific Research, attached to the National Institute of Oriental Languages and the Civilization. He has spent a very long time with Hong Kong BU with his current department, and he has served as a department head before until his retirement. And, uh, in 2019, he published China Tomorrow, Democracy or Dictatorship and conducted a very thorough talk of China's future, which is balanced, accurate, and uh, very insightful. I would uh, applaud you to read his previous book too to get a hindsight of what's happening now. And without further ado, let's put our hand together to welcome Professor John Pierre. Thank you, William. Thank you for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, and thank you to the FCC to, for inviting me again to talk to all of you today. Um, my first talk at the FCC was in 1999. Um, just after Li Donghui, the Taiwan president of the time, uh, issued a statement regard, which has been remembered today as a Liang Golun, the two-state theory. And uh, I remember we had a very vivid discussion here uh, and my prediction was, you know, I, have, I was asked question about whether, you know, the tension across the Taiwan Strait would lead to war. And I told them I'm probably not. Um, for the time being, I've been right. Uh, but 1999 was a long time ago. <laughs> we are now in 2024. And uh, I don't know whether I would uh, make the same uh, short answer. And uh, that's maybe one of the reasons of my book which was triggered by a debate which was initiated in the United States by Graham Allison uh, with his famous book called The Thucydides Trap, which this time for war is, would China and the US um, be, uh, uh, will, uh, relationship will be tense to the point that it will lead to a war between the two superpowers. And um, actually, these, um, approach to uh, the current situation between China and the US um, is not without the uh, problems. The first one is um, that I think this, uh, Graham Allison has been somewhat misunderstood because he said, yes, uh, war is, as in, when we, we had in the past power transitions between a rising power and an established power, we, we had war uh, on, a few on quite a number of occasions, but not necessarily. The second thing is, is are we witnessing a power transition today? And I'm not sure about it. What we're witnessing is a new bipolarity 
uh, in the international relations, but not necessarily a power transition. So I wanted to look at this uh, issue of war because um, the other problem was the reference made by a number of observers, including Kissinger and others, was in 1914, the pre-World War I situation. But since 1945, we're in, a, we're in another era. We're in a nuclear era. And so far, nuclear powers are, uh, haven't fought with each, uh, against each other for good reasons, because um, how can two nuclear powers guarantee that their armed confrontation will remain conventional, uh, would not morph into a nuclear war? And that f compelled, I think, uh, nuclear powers to think twice before starting a, a nuclear confront uh, military confrontation and a conventional war, for, for instance, around Taiwan. Now, what I've observed also in the last few years, um, as far as China is concerned, of course, that's one of the drivers of this book, is that you have this mixture, which is very inflammatory and very dangerous, of a nationalist patch, passion and growing military capabilities. So the, the situation today is very different from the one uh, which presided in, uh, at the end of the, 19th, of the 20th century. And um, uh, what I've observed also with Xi Jinping is that China has become more assertive, uh, more risk taker than before, um, but up to a point. And here, that's my, one of my, 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 the, the main feature of my book, is to look carefully how China has operated around uh, uh, its territory, uh, in the maritime domain it claims, around the borders it claims, and of course within the, um, within the Taiwan Strait. And what China has privileged in the last uh, 10 or 15 years, it was, has been called by quite a number of experts, uh, I'm sure you know that, a gray zone strategy, gray zone tactics, gray zone operations. And uh, the question, of course, is uh, whether those gray zone operations will lead to a, a more serious confrontation and a war. Now, let me give you a very simple explanation, a very simple definition of what is a gray zone. A gray zone is a contested arena that lies between routine statecraft and, and, and open warfare. I think what is important for a gray zone strategy is to make sure that you remain below the threshold of war. Otherwise, the gray zone strategy is not going to succeed. Now, in this book, uh, first of all, uh, let me see, yes, uh, you can see there was a, f I have looked quite a bit at, at gray zone strategy in a no, number of, in number of uh, theaters. Uh, but as you can see, there was a French edition which was published in 2021. Uh, the Chinese edition, the, sorry, the, Chinese, the English edition was published last year in May uh, 2023, and some, uh, quite a number of developments have occurred since uh, 2021, in particular the war in Ukraine. And I think the war in Ukraine, which I was able to factor in in the uh, English edition, has somewhat um, demonstrated, also somewhat confirmed my point about gray zone strategy and uh, the risk of. Uh, uh, of war between uh, superpowers, and, and that's the preference st that's still uh, made by the Xi Jinping and the Chinese leadership to continue to operate within the Grayson strategy rather than to start an open war with its uh, neighbors, uh, of course, also with, with the United States. Now, uh, among the, uh, and I will, I'm sure you're quite interested in the Taiwan scenario, so that's why I will pass on the other. Um, uh, I will deal with the other issues more, more briefly. But I wanted to say a few words about the other places where the greater strategies developed by China has been uh, deployed, but has been also rather successful. And I would first argue that the, where the greater strategy uh, developed by the PLA and different uh, security forces of, the United, of, of China, uh, where this has been the most successful is in the South China Sea. In the South China Sea, you see China uh, first of all, uh, particularly since the early 20, 2010, I mean 2012, with the, uh, the annexation of Scarborough Shore, if you know where it is, uh, and I, we move uh, to the map here. Uh, let me see. The, yes, the map uh, here uh, about the, the, the uh, Spratly Islands. Um, but Scarborough Shore is more in the north, uh, uh, 200 kilometers west of Luzon Island. Um, it's a kind of fait fait accompli which has enabled China to gradually um, dominate the South China Sea without annex, uh, actually uh, changing, apart from the Scarborough Shore, very much the status quo in the part, in this part of the South China Sea. 
what we've seen is uh, China um, creating artificial islands, building artificial islands, later militarizing them, and uh, dominating the South China Sea by its number of ships, number of coast guards, uh, but also number of uh, um, uh, mar maritime militia ships, uh, which are um, well, f fishing boats, uh, disguised, uh, uh, well, disguised fishing boats, if you want, uh, but also its, its navy. So it, it, it's, uh, it doesn't prevent other navy from navigating the South China Sea, but it makes this navigation more and more risky, actually, because all the ships from other uh, you know, navies navigating, sailing the South China Sea are tailed and shadowed by the Chinese navy all the way from the from the Malacca Strait to the north of the Taiwan Strait, actually. So uh, that's where the, I think that in the, in, in the South China Sea, China doesn't need really to um, go further than that. And one interesting uh, hotspot today, of course, is the Second Thomas Shoal. You've heard of that shoal, which is occupied by the Philippines, where the Philippines has wrecked a very old uh, ship called the Sierra Madre. And it's, very, it's getting harder and harder for the Filipinos to supply these, uh, the Marines uh, stationed in, in, uh, in, uh, in, in, on the Second Thomas Shore. So the question is whether China is going eventually to forbid those uh, supplies and, and uh, maybe annex part of it at least. Uh, but clearly uh, China doesn't need to do that. It, it needs just to dominate and to prevent other claimants to, uh, you know, to, to uh, protect their own interests in the South China Sea. In the East China Sea, uh, the Senkaku uh, Islands, China has also tried to assert its sovereignty around the Tiaoyu Senkaku. Um, now, that's been less successful. It's been successful in the sense that uh, the, the waters around the Senkaku, the continuous water and the territorial waters, so 24 miles, 12 nautical miles around the Senkaku, are now contested. This, China sent more and more coast guard there. Uh, but there is a limit to what China can do in the sense that if China uh, you know, uh, envisaged to and land on the Senkaku, that will trigger a reaction not only from the um, uh, uh, Japanese self-defense forces, but also from the U.S. because of the Article 5 of the uh, U.S.-Japan Security Treaty. And, uh, and there's been a number of announcements made by the U.S. administration about, uh, you know, uh, to, to sort of remind the Chinese that uh, even if the U.S. doesn't have a view on the, you know, to, who, to, to which country belongs the Senkaku, uh, it's um, the perimeter of, it, uh, of its treaty includes the Senkaku. So uh, that's, not an, uh, I think, one of the limits of what the Chinese uh, have tried to do uh, around the Senkaku. Uh, by the way, we see similar movements today, and I'm coming back at the end of my presentation to that, around Tinmen Island, which is an off, uh, as you know, off coast island, which is controlled by, by Taiwan today, off the coast of Fujian. Um, now, uh, so that's a, well, that's a few maps of the. Now, <coughs> China has also been more assertive in establishing these ADs in the East China Sea, which overlaps. I mean, creating an ADs is not an issue in, uh, by itself, but cre creating an ADs which overlaps with uh, other ADs is always a problem. And that's uh, one of the reasons it's, uh, it's been you know, criticized by Japan, but also to some degree by South Korea. By South, South Korea. As you can see, the Senkaku are part of the, uh, are included in the uh, Chinese AD. That's uh, also a source of frictions uh, and po possibly uh, incidents with, between China and Japan, but up to a point. Now, the other flashpoint uh, in the last few years has been the Sino Indian border with some uh, deadly incidents uh, in 2020. But here again, I don't think that the tensions which have occurred on the uh, Sino Indian borders uh, would lead to a war for a number of reasons which have to do. Uh, well, with the fact that uh, both India and China are nuclear powers, but also but because India is pretty much aware uh, that its military is not as strong as the Chinese military. It's very hard for the, for the, for the, for the, for the, for the Indians to really to match the, the Chinese, in particular on the, Himal on the, on the Himalaya. Uh, what, China, what India has tried to do is to actually catch up with China and improve its uh, road networks and its, uh, 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 along the border, which is not, as you know, very... Uh, uh, definite border. It's far from being a definite border and well deleted border because the LAC is a, lack, uh, it's a line of actual control. Uh, and even on the line of actual control, both countries disagree where it, where it should stand. So, because um, you can see that some of the incidents I mentioned earlier, which took place in, in 2020, we uh, contested areas in the uh, Himalaya between the two, two countries. 
Um, now, where the where the south where, where the the gray zone strategy has been maybe the most active, but also the most problematic, but probably uh, so far also the less convincing, I would say, uh, has been in the Taiwan Strait. And here you see, uh, well, since, particularly since 2019, uh, 2020, uh, China um, making a number of moves in the Taiwan Strait in order to narrow Ch Ta Taiwan's own uh, security space, um, denying the existence of a medium line, which was by and large very much res respected before 2019 by the Chinese side, and now which is clearly uh, um, uh, ignored by, by the Chinese Air Force and the Chinese Navy. So you see more and more of those uh, uh, flights across the medium line. What, what I would say, though, is that those flights, uh, as you can see, uh, well, that's what I have other maps which uh, show that they, are, they go further and further on Taiwan, but they stay outside of the Taiwanese airspace, uh, so to speak. Uh, it's part, they, they enter clearly the uh, Taiwanese ADs, which is the Air Defense uh, Identification Zone, which, as you can see, I'm sorry, which is pretty large. Uh, oh, uh, I'm going to, yes, go back, sorry, uh, here. Um, because it involves part of Fujian province and Zhejiang province. But uh, it, it, those flights so far haven't really, uh, and even the ships which have uh, ignored, the Chinese PLA ships which have ignored the, the uh, medium line have also uh, been uh, uh, avoided entering the uh, territorial waters. Sometimes they approach very much the contiguous water, the 24 miles, but uh, so far they haven't entered the ter territorial water, the territorial airspace, the uh, Taiwanese airspace, for good reasons, because they know very well that the uh, um, the Taiwanese Air Force would need to scramble its plane and, and to react and to ask them to leave. Um, and, and, and here, of course, increases the, the risk of incidents and even military uh, crisis. Now, the question, of course, is you know, with these more recent, uh, the most recent maps, you can see 2023, you see an intensification, int intensification of those flights, of those operations, and uh, where can it lead? Clearly, for the PLA, the, first of all, it's a learning curve. The PLA learns quite a lot about from, from those uh, and the Air Force, its pilots, uh, in, in uh, uh, deploying its uh, uh, fighters uh, and bombers uh, uh, further away from the Chinese shores. The same for its ships. As you know, there are also some so-called scientific uh, research ships, um, uh, Chinese research ships, which have uh, also navigated not long ago, sailed around Taiwan and not, not far from its contiguous waters. Um, but uh, and through those um, um, expeditions, uh, the PLA is learning a lot about the waters around the, the island and, and can be better prepared to a, a military operation. Now, uh, more recently, uh, with the after Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan, there were uh, more <coughs> threatening operations uh, launched by the PLA, including uh, the simulation of a blockade around the island and the. Um, the, uh, a number of missiles were thrown around, including some of them splashing in the Japanese uh, uh, exclusive economic zone, so uh, triggering a reaction from Japan. But uh, uh, I have to say again, if you look at the blue line around the island, they've stayed away from uh, the uh, Taiwanese uh, contiguous waters, and uh, uh, including Penghu, uh, Pescadores, which is uh, part of uh, the uh, Taiwan uh, security area. So uh, now. My argument here is that simulating a blockade is not the same as imposing a blockade. Now, uh, among the war scenarios which have been discussed in the US and elsewhere, and in China as well, of course, uh, to annex Taiwan, uh, of course, the blockade is the most likely one. The question is uh, how long you can hold the blockade and uh, whether it will be enough to sort of submit the Taiwanese, to fold the Taiwanese to to say, or we say in French, to go to Canossa or to, 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 to surrender. Uh, that's far from being uh, totally convincing, actually. The, uh, now, the question is uh, how likely a U.S. intervention, of course, would be, uh, how likely uh, this intervention would be in such a, in such a case. And uh, what I've noticed is that in, on at least four occasions, the, the Biden administration, Biden himself, has said that if there, is war, if there is an unprovoked attack against Taiwan, the U.S. would intervene. That doesn't mean it will. But uh, at the same time, uh, I think uh, it's, uh, if you look at the question from another angle, uh, if the U.S. doesn't do anything and abandon Taiwan, that's what some people say, 
uh, what uh, the uh, the uh, uh, the um, consequences has been uh, I think discussed by a number of experts not too long ago actually including foreign affairs and other journals uh, the consequence consequences will be devastating for the whole uh, region and for the security of the region because it means that the US credibility vis-a-vis -vis its allies in the region particularly Japan South Korea or the Philippines will be affected uh, not to mention Australia which is much further away but still I think it's the whole posture of the United States in the Indo-Pacific region which will be at stake. So the stakes are very high. And uh, um, I think we have maybe at maybe this stage to bring in uh, the war in Ukraine as a factor you know, affecting the calculation on uh, all the parties involved in this uh, equation. Um, there are some good news for Taiwan regarding the war in Ukraine in the sense uh, that, first of all, Ukraine was able to, re to resist an invasion um, of, uh, of its, uh, of, uh, an occupation of its uh, own capital city, Kyiv, um, and um, it has uh, uh, also triggered a strong reaction from the United States, the European Union, NATO, and uh, which have provided a lot of assistance, financial assistance and weapon, weapons to, to the to, to uh, to to uh, um, Ukraine. The other thing is in Taiwan, as in China, I think the war in Ukraine has been very much, very closely observed, very closely um, um, looked at, and 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 there are a number of uh, similarities in the sense that uh, um, um, the uh, there are, there is also a form of asymmetry between the um, China and the uh, and Taiwan, which is even more obvious than in the case of Ukraine. Now, the, the are, um, I think for Taiwan, the war in Ukraine has been a kind of, uh, if you look at the debate within Taiwan, kind of a wake-up call. It has led Taiwan to become even more serious about, uh, more serious about its security. Uh, there's been a number of changes which have occurred since the beginning of the uh, war in Ukraine, like the extending the military service uh, to one year from four months, which was very, uh, even one year, maybe it's not decided enough. Um, uh, there's a number of, uh, as you know, modernization program. Well, the, the most iconic one is one, the submarine program, but there are many other ways for the, uh, for the Taiwan to put together what I would call a, a more credible conventional deterrence uh, 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 organization uh, or, or system. And that's where I think uh, these conventional deterrence uh, is aimed as uh, again forcing the PLA and China to think twice before starting an operation which may not see, easily succeed or we be, which may be very costly in uh, human lives but also in, in equipment and uh, not to mention the economic consequences of uh, a war in the Taiwan Strait. And there's been a number of studies actually about the economic consequences by the Rodham Institute and other institutions uh, which will be, and that's a big difference with Ukraine, the, the economic consequence will be much more devastating actually for the whole world and for the Indo-Pacific region and economies than the war in Ukraine. And that's, uh, I think, a, a major difference. The other difference, and that's brings, bringing again the United States, is that the war in Ukraine is a proxy war. Uh, in the case of the, of, uh, the uh, Taiwan, it's in the case of the Taiwan scenario, it's very unlikely that it would remain a proxy war. I'm not thinking that the U.S. will put foot, boots on the ground, as we say. I think the U.S. will stay out of Taiwan, but uh, I, 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 I think it's very unlikely that the Air Force and the Navy uh, would intervene. So I think the Chinese know that pretty well, and that's why they, they, they will continue, in my view, to, to, to carry on uh, developing uh, a gray zone strategy, which is not without risks for all sides uh, involved, including Taiwan, to start with. What I'm worried about here is uh, the growing strangulation of Taiwan. And what has happened in the last few days in, uh, in around Tinmen, so, uh, and then here you've got Tinmen here, is, is quite concerning because the, um, uh, the, the questioning by China of, of, the, of, of Taiwan's jurisdiction over the territory it administers is, is a big issue. It's linked to sovereignty, of course. China doesn't recognize the Republic of China on Taiwan. And for, for the PRC, the Republic of China disappeared in 49. So, but still, uh, until recently, if, if you put aside the medium line, uh, China has uh, recognized the jurisdiction of Taiwan over its territory, 
what we call in Chinese Guanxia. And if China starts to say that around the Kinmen, the, the restricted waters or, or uh, uh, forbidden waters are non-existent, uh, that becomes problematic because uh, it, it means that uh, it can penetrate you know, in the waters around Taiwan as, as it wants. Now, I understand that the reaction of the Chinese authorities to the recent incidents were driven by some nationalist passions within China. They had to, you know, to sort of uh, address that, that nationalism uh, after the death of two f Chinese fishermen. But at the same time, you know, in boarding a, a, a tourist, uh, I don't know if the pointer works, uh, but the, there is a, yes, yeah, yeah. in boarding a tourist, uh, a tourist ship around, this, uh, uh, the, around here, uh, so west of uh, Wu Shatia, which is uh, this uh, uh, cape here, uh, west of uh, Tinmen Island, uh, which was very close. I mean, the Taiwanese tourist ship uh, two years ago was very or few, last week, sorry, was very close to this uh, medium line. I mean, this line, but still, uh, that that's a kind of question uh, uh, the uh, you know the jurisdiction of uh, Taiwan and Taiwanese coast guard around the island, and that's. I think China is pushing a bit further. And that's, part, that's typical of time China's great strategy is to, to narrow Taiwan's uh, space, to strangle Taiwan as much as possible. Now, there's a tension, of course, in Chinese strategy between, on the one hand, this great strategy and the United Front strategy that China has kept you know, developing and still promotes vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan in order to win the heart and the mind of the Taiwanese. And, uh, and I don't know how they can reach both objectives at the same time. Uh, now, what I have to say that if you go to Taiwan, people, I'm sure you, many of you have been to Taiwan lately, not long ago, and you've seen that in Taiwan there is no, no sense of panic or fear, uh, uh, you know, as a result of those, uh, um, uh, you know, those uh, um, uh, operations in the Taiwan Strait by the Chinese Air Force and the Chinese Navy. So, so um, I think there is a sense that... Uh, um, the, uh, it's still far away from affecting the, uh, the morale of the Taiwanese. But it's precisely, I think, the, the objective of these great zone strategies is to trigger some kind of uh, fear and, uh, and, uh, and uh, try to change the mindset of the Taiwanese to, so that, to convince that the, the final uh, objective uh, and the, 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 their destiny is to be reunified with mainland China uh, in the long, in longer term. But the problem with, of course, with Xi Jinping is that he wants to speed up this... Uh, process, and that's where I think the risks are getting uh, stronger. Now, uh, so on the whole, I think uh, Ch China will continue to privilege, uh, you know, the three wars it, it has in mind, uh, the uh, political war, the legal war, to sort of uh, isolate Taiwan more and more on the diplomatic front, but also the psychological war, uh, in warfare, in order to uh, uh, maybe eventually change the mindset of the Taiwanese. My, my, my question is whether it's going to succeed or not, and I'm not sure, actually. And because if you look at the Taiwanese political spectrum, they seem to be divided on many issues. But it's interesting to look at the reaction of the Kuomintang people to what happened in Tinmen a few days ago. Uh, they, that put them in a very uncomfortable position because the Kuomintang is as much attached to the sovereignty of the Re Republic of China as the DPP. So that's where you have a consensus. So I think, of course, you know, because of politics, elections, you need to be divided. But actually, there's much more consensus on Taiwan, on the sovereignty of the island, than we may believe outside of, uh, outside of Taiwan. And that's where I think that, that's where the, you know, the kind of obstacle to which the um, United Front strategy of the Chinese Communist Party is bumping. And there's a clear... Um, admission in Taiwan that uh, Taiwan may be part of China for some, but it's not, uh, it's, it's not part of the Communist Party. It's not controlled by the Communist Party. Uh, so uh, now, the context in which uh, all those uh, you know, developments are taking place, or tensions growing around Taiwan, but also in the South China Sea, is a context of a growing Cold War with the, between the United States and China. In a sense, the Cold War is helping Taiwan, guaranteeing and improving its security. Uh, uh, at the same time, uh, it creates more problems uh, in a number of, uh, and it tends, you know, it contributes to decoupling, to some extent, uh, uh, Taiwan's uh, uh, economy with China. Which, uh, as you know, the Taiwanese economy is very much uh, interdependent, you know, with with mainland China. It is, uh, it's 
China still remains its uh, major export destination with 30, 35% as against 40% before, but still very high, ahead of Southeast Asia and other countries. And, um, but at the same time, we see a trend within the region to uh, reduce, uh, to some extent, uh, its trade with mainland China, be it in South Korea, be it in Japan, and of course in the United States. So, so this new context is, uh, um, is also feeding the, uh, the tension between Taiwan and China, but not to the point of leading to a, an open war as, uh, as, uh, as we speak. So now in the longer run, you know, some people ask you know, whether in 2027, you know, when the PLA is ready, I mean, it's supposed to be ready, will, will, will Xi Jinping launch an operation against Taiwan? Again, I'm coming back to my first point, and I will close on that. We have to bear in mind that we have two nuclear powers here, which are involved in the security of Taiwan, in the, in the, in the future of Taiwan, and that uh, um, I think that uh, um, the Chinese will think twice before starting a war against Taiwan, and that's why I'm rather, as I was rather pessimistic in my previous book about the future of you know democracy in China. Here I'm more optimistic about the future of peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. So I will stop my presentation on that note. Thank you. Thank for your you. Attention. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, as a moderator, may I have the honor to ask the first question? Naturally, I I've gone through the book and. Uh, uh, prof, say you have a million dollar um, and to place a bet, um, Mrs. You, <laughs> your wife is laughing. Uh, say you have a million dollar to bet on all these hotspots. You can only bet one. Which one is the one you think that's the most dangerous? Well, I think it's just that one straight. It's still the Taiwan Strait for a reason which I briefly mentioned in my presentation. It, you know, you have the, 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 the intensity of the operations, number of uh, sh you know, ships, but more, more, I think more importantly of, of uh, aircrafts flying in the, in the Taiwan Strait, may lead, um, is, is more likely to lead to an incident than elsewhere, including the South China Sea, I think. Uh, you can have an incident in the South China Sea as well, uh, between you know, the Chinese Navy, the US Navy, other navies. Or, uh, or coast guards uh, of other claimants, but um, I think the risk are higher. The risk of uh, turning an, an incident into a crisis, military crisis, not necessarily a war, but a crisis that both sides or the, all the sides involved will have to manage. Uh, it, 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 I think it's, uh, it's more likely in the Taiwan Strait. Right. Let me just follow up on this. Um, after Xi Jinping's uh, meeting with Biden in last uh, November, uh, where uh, we see a slew of mm -hmm. resumption of China-U.S. Yep. talks, and uh, but um, many commentators are still worried about uh, China-U.S. still have not what the U.S. wanted as the as what it had with the uh, Soviet Union, where there's a mm -hmm. code of uh, 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 mm -hmm. when the navies meet um, on the sea, what a code to deal with each other, and uh, military hotline. And prob there, are, there has been arguments saying that uh, Beijing will probably they wouldn't want it because uh, it will probably embolden the U.S. And uh, the other school of thought is uh, uh, Xi probably can't can't trust his uh, commander so much because he thinks that he he wouldn't want to give them that much authority given the bedrock of all these military uh, anti-corruption things happening. What's your assessment of the possibility of China-U.S. forming some kind of meaningful and, and, and really useful gut view to prevent that kind of crisis um, to happen into the war? Well, I hope, um, well the, the good news is, uh, as you know, since uh, Biden and Xi Jinping met in San Francisco, uh, both sides have resumed mil -mil, military to military talks. Um, uh, as you know, there is another there is a mechanism which has been in play for some time between China and the U.S. This uh, maritime uh, uh, um, um, uh, mechanism, uh, you know, dialogue or interaction mechanism, which which allows uh, to avoid, I mean, manage encountered seas. But um, I, I think China has, yes, as you s suggested, I think China has a, an interest to keep. Uh, it's, I would say it's can't close to its chest and, and, and to, uh, not to make any commitment in terms of uh, communication in terms of crisis um, because that may serve China's interest actually to, 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 keep, to keep the U.S. side in, in a situation of doubt. Now, uh, we have to look at precedents 
and uh, the EP3 into one was one, you know, the, uh, the surveillance, American surveillance uh, plane which uh, had to land in uh, Hawaii, uh, Island, another way, Island. Um, what was interesting in the management of that crisis, very quickly it was uh, to, up to the diplomats to negotiate the release of the crew and then the release of the, of the plane much later. So, and I think it's a kind of mechanism I will very much uh, forecast in, in time of crisis. So they, they will, it will be up to the foreign ministry and the State Department to negotiate the, you know, the crisis, the, 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 yes, the management of the crisis and to manage the, the outcome. So, uh, but, but we don't know, yeah, that's, uh, you're right. I mean, and, and yes, and contrary to what, what was reached between the Warsaw Pact and the NATO in the, in, during the Cold War, for the time being, we haven't uh, the same type of uh, arrangement between the, the two the two uh, the two countries, and that's that's yes, I, I know on the U.S. side there's a lot of pressure on the, on the Chinese to yeah. kind of accept such a mechanisms, and to, uh, that will that will yes prevent crises and incidents uh, because as I mentioned in one of the maps, uh, like the 80s in the East China Sea, the risk of uh, incidents has increased because there's an overlap between the two 80s. Um, the Japanese and the, and the Chinese ladies. So that's a, it's a, yes, it's a, it's a boulevard open to, to incidents and, major, and possibly crisis. Yes. With that, I think we will open to the floor for questions. Okay, we have one question there. I think, let me see how much time we have. Uh, okay. uh, thank you very much. Um, it was terrible when Putin went to war with Ukraine. Uh, he had his reasons, but whatever, it's terrible, and uh, um, we, we all have our opinions about Putin. Um, go, going to war is a terrible thing, and, and for Xi Jinping, wanting to go to war with Taiwan sounds terrible as well. I was just wondering, um, um, I don't want him to go to war. I say no to war. I'm not sure that I'm allowed to say that, because I'm in Hong Kong. I'm not sure what the rules are with the uh, national security law, what I can say and what I can't say. What about the, the question is, what about the people, the common man in China? Do you have any sense as to their feelings if they had the freedom to go to their boss, Xi Jinping, and say, we want war, we don't want war? That's the first, first part of the question. The second part of the question relates to Hong Kong. What can we in Hong Kong say? Do we have an opinion? I have my opinion, but we, do, we, do we have an opinion, a public opinion, where we can say, we don't want war? Thank you very much. OK, would you like me to answer right away? Yes, okay, maybe. Oh, yes. All right, well, thank you for the question. Um, you know, there, not long ago, I think two, a year ago, there was a, a public opinion survey organized by some researcher based in Singapore, actually. Yeah. And the result was quite surprising because only, well, it's still a big number, 52% of the Chinese were asked about, you know, what, what you know, would you support a war if, if you need to go to war to annex Taiwan to, to solve the Taiwan issue, as they say in China. Uh, only 52% of the Chinese uh, said yes. So it means that you still, I mean, you have a large group of Chinese who have some doubts about it. Um, one thing that, which maybe in, among, you know, in mainland China, they, they don't totally understand is, uh, is the, you know, the cost of a war. What are the implications, the human cost? You have, you know, you've, you've had for many years a one-child policy in China. I mean, who, who, which parents would be ready to sacrifice their son in a war against Taiwan? If, if you ask the question, when I ask the question to my students, including Hong Kong, not me. Yes, I mean, well, so, you know, I think people are, and at the same time, as you know, the Chinese propaganda, the Communist Party propaganda is very much a, um, a kind of peace propaganda, saying you know, it's in the DNA of the Chinese to, to be a peaceful people, you know. Uh, I don't know whether it's true, but I think if you look at the past, it was not always true, far from it. Uh, but um, uh, I, I think, uh, well, the public opinion in, in China is not going to matter that much. Yes, you have a, you have a, a group of warmongers, but it, among the elites, I think there are people are pretty divided, I, including among, you know, the realists who dominate the IR, I mean, the international relation uh, theory experts, I mean. Um, they, they tend to be also more cautious. Uh, so now Hong Kong, I have no idea. Uh, uh, well, we, we, we will be the, uh, uh, I think we will be the um, collateral victims of any war uh, between China and the US because we're sandwiched in between the two. 
so what, what, what would happen to non-Chinese in Hong Kong, I don't know. Will be allowed to leave or will have to stay? I mean, I have no idea. Yeah, but, uh, but I prefer just we to, stay. We just stay. to frame the Hong Kong question into uh, the, the grand plan of uh, Deng Xiaoping's one country, two system, where Hong Kong did not have diplomacy and defense. So these are the parts where yes. Hong Kong probably wouldn't have a say in that. Yeah. Well, but, yes, but the public opinion, may, there might be a public opinion in Hong Kong. I mean, we, the next question, please. Uh, let's keep the question short. Yes, thank you. Professor. We want to accommodate <coughs> as much as... For the welcome as... introduction to this. Two observations. One, uh, academics and historians and commentators we always look back a hundred years. If I look forward a hundred years, uh, China is still China. Taiwan is still a, an island off the coast of China. Uh, both sides speaking Putonghua and diplomats from the UK still going there to learn how to speak Putonghua. Um, and the USA will still be on the other side of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So that's my 100 years forward perspective. On that, directly related to the other question, the Democratic Party in Hong Kong, when it was still doing things, uh, sent boats to the Senkaku Islands yes. to emphasize Chinese sovereignty. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that that's a predictive of what, uh, I don't know what to call them, people of that persuasion would do in the event of a dispute of Taiwan. I think um, we're more likely in the strangulation mode. I think we'll stay in the gray zone for quite a long time, unless hawks in America decide to force the pace. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yes, uh, hawks in America are pretty divided actually. Um, if you look at the Republican Party, you have a very strong isolationist group. I don't think they dominate the Republican Party, and they won't, I, don't think, uh, I don't think they will. But uh, that's, you know, it's, this group is more ready to, a way to call, uh, abandon Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, doesn't mean it will be, they will promote a more amicable policy towards China, but you know, they, they will think about the U.S. interests first including, uh, you know, duties and so on. Uh, but um, I think the mainstream today, as we speak, in, including within the in Republican Party, but also within the Congress as a whole, if there is a bipartisan views about China and Taiwan. So it's, it's going to be very hard for the U.S. to really either go to war or provoke a war, because that's not in the U.S. interest. The U, I mean, all the war scenarios... Uh, I mean, very clearly demonstrate that the, the, the cost of a war for the U.S. side will be also enormous in terms of hum, you know, human lives and so on, and equipment and so on. Uh, and, but uh, abandoning Taiwan seems uh, to be rather unlikely. So, but in a longer term, because he's your historian, yes, uh, the issue is, um, it's more political actually, it's a sovereignty issue, it's a political issue between two Chinese regimes actually. Yeah. Uh, and um, you know, you have to act, admit that the, the existence of the other side, I think for Taiwan it's been pretty obvious that since democratization they've admitted the existence of the PRC without mentioning the PRC. Well, now they mention more and more the PRC as such. But the, uh, the PRC has never recognized the, the survival of the ROC on part of the Chinese territory, which is the actual situation as we know. So um, there's been some, I think if there is a compromise one day, it will be a compromise, uh, you know, about, you know, one nation, two states uh, for a long term, like Germany until unification. But uh, um, I don't think that men of China can accept such a, uh, 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 such a solution because that will be a recognition, you know, it will lead to recognition of the ROC, which they won't, they won't do it. So it will be, if there is a, I think today, if there is one thing the Chinese want to, to, want to achieve and want to get from the Taiwanese side is the return to the 92 consensus according to the, which there is one China but different interpretations. Um, uh, and that, uh, to answer your question about the US, in the longer term, and I speculate that, about that in my conclusion, that may be of the, in, uh, in the US interest to twist Taiwan's elbow 
to uh, accept the one uh, uh, China principle or one China, I mean, this 92 consensus, ambiguous consensus. But beyond that, what can they do? Who in Taiwan will uh, you know, accept to be part of the PRC? No one. There is no, there is a market for that. So you really, I mean, we're coming. That's why we're coming back to the the need for coercion uh, to make the other side really surrender. And I don't, I don't think that even the gray zone strategy will be strong enough to convince the Taiwanese to go that, that far. So now on the Chinese side, I think there are some people who have toyed with the idea of Yi Zhonghua and maybe Liang Gezhenfu. No, no to China, but two governments. Uh, some people have said maybe Wang Huni himself was, wanted to promote that idea. That's been denied, actually, uh, by my own interlocutors in mainland China. But uh, that's the only solution. Because it's a political issue, it's not a military issue, it's a political issue. And uh, only a political solution can be found to a political issue. So, so my, my view is that only Igor Zhonghua, Liang Zhenfu, uh, which can work in the long term. Unless, of course, there is a regime change in mainland China. Uh, when, when, pigs, when pigs can fly, uh, you may say, but, but in 100 years from now, or maybe pigs will fly. I'd like to make a comment. Um, okay. Barbara, member here, I come from an old Kuomintang family. My uncle was oh. governor of the central bank and prime minister under Jiang Jingguo and Li oh. Wei. Oh. So I just want to make a comment about the Kuomintang, which is obviously not the leading party, and no. it's changed since the late Well, they control the, they, they control the they, Li Fa Yuan. Yes, they, they do. They do the Li Fa Yuan, which is, well, but they're not very impressive. Anyway, never mind. But the thing <laughs> is, the Kuomintang, we always believed, is one China. It's just about who was the legitimate ruler yeah. of China. Well, I think it's pretty obvious. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I'm asked today, what am I? I don't say I'm Taiwanese. I'm Chinese. And I'm proud to be Chinese, but with Chinese, all the heritage mm, mm, of that. Mm, mm. Right? So, but I, so that's why I just want to make a comment about does the average man in Taiwan think about you know, being part of China? I think, look at how Taipei is laid out. It is a Chinese mm. city. People speak Putonghua, right? And it's, we're all really the same people but doing if different things. If you go things. to Tainan, it's probably. Okay, in I've never been to Tainan there. because yeah. I'm, a, I'm not a Kaohsiung person, so I've never been down there. Okay. Oh, you should. But, um, I think it's just interesting where the Taiwanese are going to go. As you said, you know, most of the economy is very, very interrelated with mm -hmm. China. Um, I think the Democratic Party has really ruined the economy over the last 10, 15 years. And Taiwan is really nothing without China. Mm. Okay. Economically. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, thank you, but no, for, thank you for your remark. You know, when you mentioned Chiang Kai-shek and, uh, you know, and Chiang Qingguo, it reminds me of a very well-known saying by Chiang Kai-shek, Han Zhe Bu Liang Li, which means, you know, we, we can't mix with the bandits. Now, I think we, we have to change. I mean, the Kuomintang has changed its view about that. They've changed. So we, there are two. We, we have to recognize the other side, we, the, which is legitimate to exist. And then the question is what kind of interaction we have with both, you know, the other side. Which is interesting that someone, there is a delegation from the Kuomintang visiting China now as we speak. I think Xia uh, Lijian is in China again. or will go to China very soon. So in order to make sure that there will be some kind of um, channel of communication, uh, not with the government, but some, some people within, China, within Taiwan itself. No, I uh, uh, agree with you that uh, um, they, they but, but I think you wanted to mention the Taiwanese identity, which is also very strong. So from a political point of view, I think they feel Taiwanese. But what is interesting is the DPP has never changed the symbols of Taiwan, the ROC, the flag, national anthem, uh, Sam Min Jui, the, uh, uh, the constitution, and so, so you, you know, it's, uh, so I think if China, the PRC, the Communist China, accepts the constitutional envelope of Taiwan, I think they, they can be some kind of arrangement without go, going as far as the war. Exactly. I, I don't think there will be war. And I think about uh, the gentleman's comment about 100 years ahead. I think it will be one country. Yeah. Well, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Can we have we'll see. probably the last question? Yeah. Does the fact that uh, nobody currently serving in the Chinese military has had combat experience and yep. that the Chinese military, as it stands now, the PLA basically, has had very, very little offshore military experience. I mean, you count the uh, invasion of Vietnam in 79, uh, where they were basically defeated by second-line Vietnamese troops, and uh, little 
street brawl in Lacta, and uh, or like I, I can't pronounce it correctly, and um, a little uh, dust up in East Africa as part of a UN force where they did not equip themselves very well. Uh, does all of that factor into the mainland calculus at all? Yes. No, that's a very good point. You know, for the sake of time, I didn't uh, mention this last chapter of my book, which has to do with the likely overseas operation of the PLA. Uh, as you mentioned very rightly, uh, the PLA has not fought in a war since 79. So it has remained an untested force. We don't know how would the PLA be, behave in a battle, uh, in a war. Uh, it's, a big, it's a big unknown. Uh, it has a lot of capability. That, you know, among my slides, you've seen the, you know, the, they've uh, increased their capability, Air Force, they've improved the Air Force very much, their Navy very much. Their Marine Corps has become much stronger now. Uh, and the objective is to have 100,000 marine, uh, in Marines uh, ready to be deployed across the Taiwan Strait or overseas. And uh, in the last chapter of my book, uh, um, deal with this, uh, were well, the past uh, uh, overseas operation, which uh, were not in, in, you know, conducted in, in, in a war scenario. When, uh, when there were military operations other than wars, like uh, uh, sending medical um, PLA doctors to um, West Africa to, to, to fight against Ebola crisis, uh, or establishing a, a base uh, in Djibouti and also for, for supplying and, and resourcing uh, peacekeepers working under, you know, operating under the UN banner in Africa and elsewhere. So, but what, where I see a, a, you know, a more likely scenario of a, a military operation conducted by the PLA is, uh, is when Chinese nationals or Chinese interests are in danger somewhere in, in Africa and elsewhere. And uh, I would see that as a limited operation to demonstrate that the PLA is capable of conducting such an operation overseas. And that, for me, is much more likely. Or even off the, co off the border of China in, uh, in northern Afghanistan or in uh, northern Myanmar, uh, because we know that the Chinese have, you know, they have a base in Tajikistan in order to prevent the, you know, the Uyghur um, activists from crossing the border and getting it back to, to, to Xinjiang. Or, or in Myanmar, they also, for, you know, northern Myanmar is off the control of the central authority of Myanmar. And, they, and, and there are a lot of, uh, I mean, they, they some, at one point, there may be some need for the PLA to intervene or the media to restore order and stability and to get rid of those scams people. Uh, for the time being, they work with the rebels to, to deal with the, 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 the scam operations in northern Myanmar. But, but that's where I see more, a more likely scenario of a first experience for the PLA of a, of a military operation overseas. Uh, but uh, how to learn to you know, deploy and, and, and operate in a, in a non-friendly environment. Because so, so far they've operated in a friendly environment. Even when they ev evacuated national from Libya in 2011, yes. uh, with the help of the Air Force, but also a lot of... Uh, uh, civilian uh, ships, actually. Uh, that was a, the, the, uh, the environment was much more friendly. I often jokingly tell my U.S. friends that uh, isn't it the good thing that the PLA is untested? When Pentagon wants more budget, you can just say, oh, it's formidable force. When, so if you want to turn the propaganda around, you say, ah, it's trash. Right? So it, the duality works perfectly for Pentagon, depending on how you want to spin it, right? Uh, the, well, the PLA has been tested is, uh, again in, in non-military operations, like you know relief operation within China and e even outside of China. So uh, yes, I mean, they, they, and uh, but but beyond that, no, they have, that hasn't been the case, and uh, and that's a big unknown for the future. I think. Okay, uh, I'm so sorry that the time's up, and uh, I would really encourage you to get a copy of uh, John Pierre's latest book. All the answers are in the book. <laughs> Thank you very much.